Good day students. In today's lecture we're going to be exploring the concepts of learning and memory. Learning and memory and the human capacity to engage in learning and memory to a very high degree sets us apart from other animals. There has been a tremendous advance in our understanding of learning and memory over the past 20 years. You could go so far as to call it a revolution. Yet despite these advances, we're still in the infancy of really grasping how is it learning is taking place in the brain and how can we actually um, find ways to adjust learning and memory in the brain, which in some ways might be considered the holy grail of neuroscience. In today's lecture, we want to explore some of the basic concepts regarding the different types of memory and the different areas of the CNS that are involved in learning and memory. And then we're going to talk about the role of synaptic plasticity as a, a prototype or a model for learning. And then we'll conclude with an examination of dementia with particular reference for Alzheimer's disease. That last issue of Alzheimer's disease is increasingly becoming more important. Not only in developed nations uh, is the population aging, but also in nations like the Caribbean islands is life expectancy increasing. And so these neurodegenerative diseases often associated with life over 60 are becoming more and more important within our Caribbean populations. So let's just begin by giving some basic definitions concerning what we're going to be discussing in this lecture. And then this will allow us to give three core aspects of learning and memory. So we can say learning is the process by which an organism or an animal acquires knowledge about its environment. Memory, though, is the storage or retention of that knowledge. So having acquired information about the environment, that information has to be stored. And then that stored information has to be retrieved. There must be a retrieval mechanism. Without a retrieval mechanism, that memory is of no real use or no real benefit to the animal. And so we can um, summarize those three uh, processes in this particular diagram and say learning and memory has three facets. There's an acquisition process, there's a process of storage, and there's a process of retrieval. And you can see in the diagram, acquisition of information comes through the process of our various senses. And as it comes into the body, we know that it's encoded, and then it goes somewhere within the brain and it's stored. We can also see in the diagram that we have two types of storage mechanisms. We have short-term storage and working memory, but then that has to be converted into long-term storage. Uh, long-term storage now talks about memories of our past. You may be a 21-year-old student listening to this, but you can remember images and accounts and vacations from when you were six or seven. That's what we mean by long-term storage. So those are the three facets of learning and memory. Acquisition, storage, and three the ability to retrieve that information. If you listen to this lecture and then a question comes on your final exa examination about learning and memory, you want to know that you can retrieve that information to answer the question correctly. So there are two fundamental questions which neuroscientists and researchers have been uh, probing concerning memories. And the first is where in the brain are memories stored? Uh, is there a particular structure or brain uh, nuclei where memories are stored. And then the second question we want to consider is what are the mechanisms by which memories are stored? If memories are stored in the cerebellum, well how does the cerebellum store memories? So we want to begin probing these questions. And to do that I want to, um, I want to take you to this particular uh, movie. Uh, it's a popular movie, I believe it was released in 2004, and it's called 51st Dates. 51st Dates. And it was um, made popular by two well-known um, actors, Adam Sandler, Adam Sandler and Drew Barrymore. So let's just look at a little trailer for this particular movie right now. Dr. Henry Ross's best relationships were with his patients, and he wasn't looking to settle down. But one day, the unthinkable happened. Sha -la 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 -la. Are you staring at me or her? Because you're starting to freak me out. I miss you. Henry Rock. The only problem is... Good morning. <laughs> what? 
what's going on? About a year ago, Lucy was in a terrible car accident. She lost her short-term memory. She won't remember him tomorrow. Don't you remember me a little? <laughs> From Columbia Pictures. Every day, you get her to fall in love with you again? You don't even open the fucking car door for me anymore. You're in trouble! <laughs> Comes a story about winning over the girl of your dreams. Do you have any idea who I am? I've never even met you. <laughs> Every single day. Excuse me, Lucy Whitmore? Yes? I have a delivery for you. I am a secret admirer. <laughs> Adam Sandler. And she stops, just let her pet you and look cute. Okay, here she comes, smile. Why is she not slowing down? Uh-oh. Oh no! That didn't work. Drew Barrymore. Pretend you're attacking me so she pulls over. What do you think we are doing? Coming over here, taking our pineapple. Help me, please. I'm getting your big oh! So some of you may have seen that movie and it was quite humorous. And in the movie, one of the main characters played by Drew Barrymore, she seems to have a particular type of memory loss. She has no ability to form new memories. So every time she goes out on a date with Adam Sandler, while she enjoys the date and her short-term memory is fine, by the time the next morning arrives, she's forgotten everything. Hence the title of the movie, Fifty First Dates. Now that movie is loosely based on uh, a famous uh, case from neuroscience history concerning what is traditionally known as patient HM. HM is the initials of a gentleman called Henry Moliason and his identity was kept hidden until he passed away in I believe 2009. And he is one of the most famous cases in neuroscience history. Um, Henry suffered from intractable epilepsy. He was born around 1930, somewhere there, and it's reported that he had a bicycle accident when he was quite young, and that might have triggered the epilepsy. But by the time he was in his early 20s, that epilepsy um, was very, very bad. It's reported he would have several seizures a day of the tonic-clonic type, and this basically made his life very, very difficult. You can imagine his quality of life was suffering tremendously. At that time, um, our, uh, the development of psychopharmacology was very limited. And so there were no drugs that was controlling Henry's um, epilepsy. And this top picture here is a picture of Henry um, in his young adult life. Henry found himself meeting a young neurosurgeon at the time. Uh, Scoville, William Scoville, who was becoming quite famous for his uh, pioneering work in neurosurgery. He was also known as a risk taker, and given Henry's condition, uh, Scoville was able to suggest to Henry that the site of uh, his lesions was in the medial temporal lobe, and given the severe nature of his lesions, there was a need to remove both areas, both medial temporal lobe areas. And Patient H.M. Henry, uh, he didn't have much to lose and he agreed to have the surgery. And the surgery was actually a success. After the surgery, Henry no longer suffered from epilepsy. But it was discovered that Henry developed a severe memory deficit. Just like in the movie with Drew Barrymore, Henry apparently could no longer form any new memories. Now this diagram here just shows you the medial temporal lobe region. And inside of the medial temporal lobe region, there's one particular structure of uh, great importance that we're going to consider, the hippocampus. And the diagram on the right, it's not the best image, but it is an H MRI scan of patient HM, just showing you that he no longer has those medial temporal lobe structures. Um, I believe uh, the area was actually cauterized in the surgery by Scoville. So what was discovered about patient HM? Well, immediately when it was realized that he was having difficulty with his memory, uh, a young psychologist uh, was brought in to help with the case. And her name was Brenda Milner. This is a picture of her later in life. And she would work with patient HM for many, many years and knew him up until his death. Um, she was able to show that Henry de demonstrated above normal intelligence. So the surgery did not 
uh, interfere with his um, intelligence. He had normal short-term memory as shown by digit span performance. But he was unable to recall any events that occurred after the surgery. There was a striking inability to form new memories. Yet Brenda Milner was also able to show that Henry did have a type of memory. He was able to learn certain tasks. In particular, he was able to learn the mirror drawing task in which you're required to copy a star, but do this by looking at the star in the mirror. And you can see that um, when first asked to do this task, it proves very difficult. You make a lot of mistakes. But through several trials over several days, it's much improved. And this is what happened to Henry. Even though on day three, his performance was much improved, he would still tell you, but I don't remember doing this task before. I've never done it before. Yet clearly, some type of memory system was working within his brain because his performance had improved. So we could say that patient HM had anterograde amnesia, which was characterized by intact short-term memory. He had preserved memory for remote events before the surgery, but he had no ability to form new long-term memories. And it seemed that he now had two different types of memory. He couldn't form explicit memories, but he could form implicit memories. So let's just talk very briefly about amnesia. Here's a little bit of humor. Uh, a lady turns up in the amnesic clinic, and the doctor says, you're not going to get better if you don't start taking these pills. And she replies, I keep forgetting. This diagram here tells us that there are two types of amnesia. Both are triggered by a traumatic event, as most cases of amnesia are. In anterior grade amnesia, which is what happened to HM, he has memory of all the events that occurred before his surgery, but he's unable to form any new memories, so after that, there's no memory formation. In retrograde memory loss, or retrograde amnesia, you're able to form new memories after the trauma, but the preceding time before the trauma is what you lose memory for. And most people with retrograde memory are able to remember their distant memories, unless it's a very, very severe case in which they've lost all of their memory before the trauma. But that's highly unusual. And so we see the difference between retrograde amnesia and anterior grade amnesia. Retrograde means you have no memory of the events before the trauma. Anterior grade amnesia means you have no ability to form memories after the trauma. So from patient HM, we learned that there are two memory systems. The first is called declarative or explicit. And those are things you know that you can tell others. Um, you can describe them by a statement of fact. The second is called non-declarative or implicit. And these are things you demonstrate by how you do them. And this has now allowed us to classify memories. So explicit memories are considered to be knowledge about the environment. We can describe them as being autobiogra autobiographical or factual. It's the kind of information that you acquire as you're listening to this lecture. And the way that you demonstrate to me or any of your other teachers that you have learned from this lecture is by a statement of fact, by writing it down on a piece of paper or by doing an oral examination. And that's the type of memory loss that um, Henry suffered from. However, his implicit memory was still intact. He still had memory and knowledge of how to do things, as demonstrated by the improved performance on the mirror drawing task. This could include other motor skills like learning to ride a bicycle, learning to play tennis, learning to drive a manual car. Notice in all of these cases, it did not require conscious recall. Those tasks were reflexive and therefore they didn't require the higher cognitive functions of recall. So again, if we consider HM, he could improve on the mirror drawing task, but he had no memory of ever doing the task before. Implicit memory is acquired slowly over several trials. And one interesting thing is if you start off with explicit memory, such as learning to drive a car, over time and repeated trials, that can actually be converted into an implicit memory. So now we can use uh, diagrams like this to classify memory. 
we can say that memory is first of all classified into short-term or working memory and it's also classified into long-term memory and when we're looking at long-term memories we divide it into declarative or explicit and non-declarative and implicit and this diagram on this page here just gives you a little bit more details of the divisions and you can study that on your notes and begin to understand the different ways in which memories are now classified. Now there's one more important thing we learned uh, from patient HM and that's the role of the hippocampus. Remember the surgery that patient HM underwent was to remove his medial temporal lobes and in particular the hippocampus was removed. And we now know that the hippocampus is very very important for memory but hippocampus is not where memories are stored. However, the hippocampus appears to be the key structure that's involved in the process of memory consolidation, of moving an explicit memory from short-term memory to long-term memory. So if I return to the movie, um, as long as Drew Barrymore was out on the date with Adam Sandler, her short-term memory was working. The minute the date ended and they went their separate ways, there was no consolidation. There was no memory consolidation. For some reason, the hippocampus was not working. And just like patient HM, she was therefore no longer to, able to take the short-term memory and convert it into a long-term memory. And so the hippocampus and the medial temporal lobe structures appear to be critical for consolidation of memories. You will note in this diagram that the amygdala, which is very important for processing emotional response, is intimately connected to the hippocampus and we know that emotions are very much connected with memory formation. So let's begin to ask the question well how are memories stored? How are memories stored? And to understand this we're going to look a little bit more at implicit memories. Now we can divide implicit memories into non-associative learning and associative learning. And this really is talking about if there's a relationship between stimuli. Is there one stimulus or are there several stimulus that are being related, stimuli being related together? Under non-associative learning, we talk about habituation, dishabituation, and sensitization. And under associative learning, we talk about classical conditioning and operant conditioning. Now, habituation is defined as a decrease in response to a benign stimulus that has lost its meaning or novelty. And the best example I can give you is, for example, uh, if you enter a room and there's a loud clock ticking. At first you may notice the clock ticking, but after a while you no longer notice it. Or in today's modern environment, this is more likely to occur with an air conditioning unit. When you first enter the room, you might hear the hum of the air conditioning unit or any piece of ma machinery, but soon afterwards you forget it. That stimulus is benign. It has no meaning attached to it. So whereas when you first entered the room, you noticed it, you paid attention to it, after a while, your response gradually disappears. This habituation is partial or complete restoration of the initial response following the presentation of another novel, novel stimulus. For example, if your air conditioned unit started to drip or to leak, your attention might be drawn to the air conditioned unit and then suddenly you notice the sound again. Sensitization is a little bit, uh, in many ways, is the opposite of habituation. It's an increase in response to an irritant or harmful stimulus. And so if you're continually presented with an irritant or harmful stimulus, over time that can lead to an exaggerated response. And this has become very well known when we consider the case of post-traumatic stress syndrome. A soldier, for example, who goes out to war and is continually exposed to the loud, violent noises of battle can return home and this noise of uh, a door banging can startle him and take him back in time and trigger memories in an exaggerated way. And this could be an example of sensitization. Now, the reason we're considering these examples is because these very simple examples of learning and memory have been studied in this particular creature. This animal here is Aplasia californica. And much of the early pioneering work on memory systems was done in this particular sea snail. The reason for this is because the sea snail, Aplasia, 
has a very simple nervous system consisting of only about 20,000 neurons. But those neurons are some of the largest in the animal kingdom, which means they can be easily recorded and studied. And the person who pioneered much of this work was a Nobel Prize physiologist, Dr. Eric Kandel. And he received the Nobel Prize in 2000 for his work on aplasia. He was the first person to demonstrate, I believe, um, that memories are actually stored within the synapses. Now, this is a very, very important point that I want you to understand. Memories are stored within the synapses. The first person to actually propose that concept was Donald Hebb. And he came up with this rule called Hebb's rule or Hebb's postulate. And this rule says that when presynaptic cell A repeatedly takes part in firing presynaptic cell, postsynaptic cell B, the ability of A to excite B will be increased. Let me say that again. Hebb suggested that when presynaptic cell A repeatedly takes part in firing postsynaptic cell B, the ability of A to excite B will be increased. He was basically suggesting that the place where memory formation takes place is due to a change in the synapse. And Kandel and his colleagues were able to study the synapses of aplasia and were able to show very, very nicely and very, very clearly that this was proving to be true. Now, Hebb's rules for synaptic modification have been simplified. You can read this slide later. But his rules have been simplified to, do, to these two basic statements. Neurons that fire together, wire together. Neurons that fire together, wire together. In other words, if two neurons are firing at the same time, then their contacts, that circuitry is going to get stronger. However, the opposite is also true. Neurons that fire out of sync lose their link. So neurons that don't fire together don't form strong connections. And therefore, there's no memory circuit formed there. So let's continue this by looking at a little video talking about aplasia and some of the work that was done in aplasia. This sea snail, called aplasia, is somewhat of a celebrity, at least in the world of memory research. It was this lowly snail that revolutionized the way neurobiologists, like David Glansman, think of memory. But how do you give a snail a memory? We're going to give it a few shots, but don't worry, it's not going to harm the animals. Okay. It's not going to produce any long-term damage. Wow. Giving it electrical shocks teaches the aplesia that the world is a dangerous place. How do we know it's actually learned? We look at a reflex. Touch the siphon of an aplasia, and it triggers a defensive withdrawal reflex. And I'm just going to touch the siphon like that. And there you see, that's the reflex. This reflex can tell scientists if the snail has formed the memory. The longer the gill and siphon remain retracted, that's an indication that it's learned what we taught it. An aplasia that hasn't been given any shocks will respond with a short-lived contraction. There it's out. So, so 11, 11 seconds. seconds. All right. But an aplasia that was taught to be on guard responds much differently. Now there's the reflex. Now the point is that it stays tucked. So this guy's on a high state of alert here. Yeah. So you see the siphon's just starting to come out now. And at 45, 45 seconds. seconds. So it's four times as long as the naive animal. And it's learned that there's a danger in its environment. That's yeah, what it's learned. This learning is observed in its changed behavior, but scientists can also see signs of memory in Aplesia's legendary brain. Let's just say this sea snail is neurologically well endowed. It has very large, huge, some of the biggest neurons in the world. Its few but gigantic neurons inspired researchers to essentially create an Aplesia mini-brain out of a sensory neuron and a motor neuron. We take those out of the animal and we put them into cell culture, and they grow together, and then we have a mini circuit, a neural circuit. Scientists can see, on a cellular level, what happens as the mini brain forms a memory. 
So, what is happening? Basically, we see two things. The synapse between the sensory neuron and the motor neuron gets stronger. When the snail gets zapped with electricity, the neurons start communicating differently, sending more, stronger chemical signals and receiving more signals. This change, which can happen quite quickly, but doesn't last forever, corresponds to short-term memory. But administer the shocks over a longer period of time, and the two neurons physically change as the snail learns. Anatomically, we actually see the growth of new synaptic connections between the sensory and motor neuron. And it's this physical change in the neurons that is long-term memory. As the snail learns over time, its brain is making more and more connections, so that even when the snail gets a break from the shocks, it will still remember them. Besides training sea snails to be on a high state of alert, the research on aplesia has been integral in understanding learning and memory, and not just for snails. When you're looking at these changes in aplesia, you're basically looking at the bedrock of learning. Those same processes take place in our brains. And with the advancements in memory research that aplesia has already inspired, it is most likely going to remain in the spotlight for decades to come. So that's a very nice um, little video just showing you the role that aplasia has played inside of memory research. If you missed it, this is a little diagram here just highlighting the, the role of aplasia. Um, we can see here, if I just pull up this laser pointer, that this is the structure that was being referred to in the video. Because they live in water, they breathe with gills and they have a siphon. And they also have a tail and these are linked together by neuronal circuits. Now, if you keep touching the siphon, what's going to happen is you're going to get the gill withdrawal reflex. But in habituation, if you keep touching the siphon and the touch is benign, it doesn't harm the animal, it doesn't harm a pleasure, what you find is the withdrawal reflex gets smaller and smaller and eventually is very minimal. And this is an example of habituation. Just to make sure that this was not due to motor fatigue, if you now touch the head, you notice you get a very large response, indicating the muscles responsible for gill withdrawal are still intact, and it really was a memory process of habituation that was taking place um, when we kept touching the siphon. Now what Candel and colleagues were able to do is they were able to isolate the nervous uh, neurons, the neurons that are responsible for this reflex. And as you can see, they were able to isolate the sensory neuron coming from the skin of the siphon and found out it has a connection directly onto the motor neuron that causes contraction of the gill muscle. And then they were able to record from both neurons during the process of withdrawal. So this is the recording from the presynaptic neuron. And you can see these lovely action potentials firing every time it's stimulated. And this is a recording from the postsynaptic neuron. And one thing you notice is that if there's repeated stimulation coming into the presynaptic neuron, that notice the postsynaptic response gets smaller and smaller. And it was shown that this was because there was less neurotransmitter being released. And so we see a presynaptic change, less neurotransmitter is being released, is changing the function of the synapse, and it's leading to a memory called habituation. And so this was some of the first evidence to show that changes in synapses are indeed responsible for memory. Now, the same can be seen for sensitization. In sensitization, if you periodically touch the gill, not as often as we do in ha habituation, but um, much, much less often, you get a withdrawal response. But then if you were to suddenly shock the tail, the withdrawal response gets much more exaggerated when you continue to touch the siphon. And so this is called sensitization. Now the circuitry for this is a little bit more complicated. We can see here this is the, circ this is the neuron coming from the tail and it's forming a complex connection on the sensory neuron from the siphon. And what Candle and his colleagues were able to show is that this neuron coming from the tail releases the neurotransmitter serotonin in response to the shock. 
And serotonin leads to the activation of adenocyclase or cyclic AMP. And the cyclic AMP that's produced in the presynaptic cell activates a protein kinase, which closes potassium channels found on the presynaptic cell. Now when potassium channels close, the presynaptic cell then depolarizes. And the end result is it allows more calcium ions to be admitted when an action potential arises, leading to greater release of neurotransmitter. So in this particular case, sensitization is triggered by the release of more neurotransmitter. Unlike habituation, habituation which was triggered by less neurotransmitter. But in both cases, the thing that is changing and allowing the memory to form is a changing in function of the synapse. Let me run through the process of um, sensitization for you one more time. As we said, in this particular model, it's more complex because three neurons are involved. And the neuron from the tail actually synapses on the presynaptic neuron coming from the gill, sorry, coming from the siphon. When the tail is shocked, it releases serotonin, which activates adenylcyclase in the sensory neuron coming from the siphon. Cyclic AMP then activates protein kinase A. And this then attaches a phosphate group to the potassium channel, causing it to close. That means the conductance of potassium decreases in the sensory presynaptic neuron, and it allows more calcium to enter with depolarization, leading to greater neurotransmitter release and triggering sensitization. And so this was quite pioneering work by Candle and colleagues, which led to his Nobel Prize. Now, Candle and colleagues were then able to go and look at other forms of learning. In particular, they were able to look at associative learning, classical conditioning, and operant conditioning. And I'm sure you have heard about these types of learning before. I will just remind you that in classical conditioning, you have an unconditioned stimulus like food, which induces an unconditioned response in the dog, such as salivation. If this food is now paired with a neutral stimulus, and they have to be paired closely in time, and that is repeatedly done. When the food is removed and the sound is executed, what you find is that sound now produces a response. So we have a conditioned stimulus and a conditioned response. The sound now triggers salivation in the dog. And we call this classical conditioning. Because the sound has been paired with the food over time, this dog now learns and associates the sound with food and therefore responds. In operant condition, we have a situation where an animal can learn a relationship between a stimulus and a behavior. So we have a rat randomly exploring a maze. And if it goes to the left, it gets rewarded with food. If it goes to the right, it gets a shock. The result is, over time, the rat begins to learn that every time it goes on the right, it gets food. And every time it goes on the left, it gets a shock. And it starts to decide to continually only go on the right. Okay. So we can see here that the rat has learned that there's a good stimulus on the right. And this is called operant conditioning. And this is used extensively in psychology as being key for behavioral modification. Um, or if you think about... Uh, when you are punished as a child, the punishment there is serving as a negative reinforcer, seeking to shift behavior. Now, Kandel was able to look at these two models of learning and apply them to the circuitry of aplasia, and able to show very, very clearly that the circuitry of aplasia was able to replicate classical conditioning and operant conditioning, and that these changes were also due to changes taking place. In the synapse. And so the basic take home message here is that it seems that indeed evidence is now accumulating that memories are actually stored in synapses. So the question is does this also apply in mammals? It's one thing for it to work in the sea snail, but does it also apply in mammals? And this is, um, this actually is shown to be true. And it came about due to another, um, perhaps even more massive discovery that took place um, in the late 60s and was published in 1973. 
And that was the discovery of a phenomenon called long-term potentiation. Now, long-term potentiation is defined as an enduring increase in synaptic efficacy following high-frequency tetanic stimulation of the afferent fibers. Basically, the synapse begins to function more efficiently. Think of it like this. If one neurotransmitter, when released, produced a one millivolt response in the postsynaptic cell, after LTP, that one neurotransmitter produces an exaggerated response of maybe five millivolts. And so you can see that here. Initially, when stimulating, the response produces a, a, <clears throat> a potential that's about 0.1 millivolts. But after the tetanic stimulation, the same response is producing a greatly exaggerated response, almost 100% bigger. And these are recordings taken after tetanic stimulation. This is our baseline. Then one hour after tetanic stimulation, 24 hours after, 48 hours after, all the way up to 96 hours after, we see that the, the long-term potentiation is still in effect. And this was discovered by two scientists, Bliss and Lomo, working on the rabbit hippocampus. Note again the importance of the hippocampus turning up as being a key structure involved in memory. And scientists got very, very excited about this discovery because it seemed to them that they had discovered a memory trace, a memory engram. And so over the last 40 years, there have been thousands and thousands of papers written trying to explore LTP. How does it come about and its role in memory? Some of the evidence has now accumulated to suggest that LTP does have a role in memory. One memory task that you can give an animal is called the Morris water maze, where a rodent is placed in a, a water bath, a large water bath, and it has to swim to find a hidden platform. If it's repeatedly placed in the bath, you find that on the first few times, it takes a long time to discover the platform. But over time, it quickly learns. And very soon after several blocks of trials, it knows exactly where to form the platform, where to find the platform. However, if you block LTP with NMDA antagonists, or if you use a knockout mouse whose NMDA receptors are no longer functional, what you discover, it is no longer able to find the platform. It doesn't learn as well. And so several hundred experiments have been shown that if you block LTP with various antagonists and in various mechanisms, you actually inhibit memory processes. We've also been able to demonstrate that you get LTP-like recordings during and after learning in both the hippocampus and the amygdala, two structures that are very, very important for memory. And a third piece of evidence that suggests that LTP does have a role in memory, and might even equal the memory trace, is that the hippocampus has a very powerful rhythm to it called the theta rhythm. Its neurons fire according to this theta rhythm. And this theta rhythm has been shown to powerfully induce LTP. So not only can we induce LTP with tetanic stimulation, but if we apply this theta rhythm to a cell or to a hippocampal slice, you also get LTP being induced. And so it seems like the endogenous rhythms of the hippocampus are facilitating LTP and possibly facilitating learning. So with all of this evidence to suggest that LTP is indeed a part of memory, the next question we must ask ourselves is, well, how is LTP brought about? But before that, scientists also were able to discover LTD, that not only do neurons increase synaptic efficacy, but they can decrease synaptic efficacy. And LTD, of course, now is long-term depression. It's almost the opposite of LTP. And the place where LTP has, LTD sorry, has been best studied is in the cerebellum. And so here you see another experimental setup where we stimulate the parallel fibers and record from the Purkinje fibers. And you can stimulate the climbing fiber as well. And the, the Purkinje cell response, once conditioned, goes down. Clear example of LTD. An enduring weakening of synaptic strength following long-term low-frequency stimulation. So how does LTP come about? Well, 
The key to LTP is understanding the NMDA receptor. The NMDA receptor, as you know, is a type of glutamate receptor. Glutamate receptors are divided into ionotropic receptors, which open ion channels, and metabotropic receptors, which activate G proteins. And if you look at ionotropic glutamate receptors, there are three types, AMPA, NMDA, and kinate acid receptors, kinate receptors. AMPA receptors are very predominant, and they're responsible for normal excitatory neurotransmission. Now, in thinking about the synapse as being key for memory, people had proposed the idea that if a synapse was going to be important for memory, and in order for memory to take place, neuron A must fire when neuron B is firing, it was suggested that there must be some way that the brain is able to recognize that both neurons are firing at the same time. There needs to be what is termed a coincidence detector. A coincidence detector. Is there something that happens when both presynaptic activity and postsynaptic activity are occurring at the same time? How can we know that it takes place? And it turns out that the NMDA receptor does exactly that. It functions as a coincidence detector. When glutamate is released from the presynaptic terminals, it acts on AMPA receptors, and it produces a small amount of depolarization. However, if you have a strong stimulus, like a tetanic stimulus coming along the presynaptic cell, this, releases, this leads to a massive release of glutamate, which activates many, many AMPA receptors. And the end result is you have a significant depolarization of the postsynaptic cell membrane. Now this is where the NMDA receptor sits. And you know that in the NMDA receptor channel is a magnesium ion. And you also know that that magnesium blockade, which stops calcium entering the NMDA receptor, gets removed when the postsynaptic cell is depolarized. So this magnesium blockade is voltage dependent. So when you have a very strong stimulus leading to much amper receptor stimulation and much depolarization, the end result is the magnesium pops out and now calcium can now enter the cell via the NMDA receptor. And so the NMDA receptor is able to detect both the massive release of glutamate from the presynaptic terminal and two, the big post uh, synaptic depolarization triggered by that massive release. And so it functions as the coincidence detector, detecting presynaptic activation and postsynaptic activation at the same time. Let me just say that again. When the tetanic stimulus arrives, it leads to a massive release of glutamate, which stimulates hundreds of AMPA receptors. And the end result is there's strong depolarization of the postsynaptic membrane which causes the magnesium blockade to be removed from the NMDA receptor. The result is calcium can now enter the cell via the NMDA receptor. And calcium then triggers the activation of numerous kinases in the postsynaptic cell. Now the exact kinases that get activated, you don't need to know. But you do need to know that these kinases cause two things to happen. They cause retrograde messengers to leave the postsynaptic cell and to diffuse back to the presynaptic cell and enhance neurotransmitter release. Let me say that again. These kinases that get activated cause retrograde messengers, retrograde neurotransmitters, to diffuse backwards from the postsynaptic cell to the presynaptic cell to increase neurotransmitter release. Candidates that have been identified as retrograde messengers include nitric oxide, carbon monoxide, and endocannabinoids. But the kinases also change the activity at the postsynaptic cell. They make AMPA receptors more sensitive to glutamate, but they also cause AMPA receptors that were in the cytoplasm to get inserted in the postsynaptic cell. So if prior to LTP there were two AMPA receptors in the postsynaptic cell, after LTP, that number might be increased to maybe 10. And so you have both presynaptic changes and postsynaptic changes, which all lead to this long-lasting increase in efficacy at the neuron, at the synapse, sorry, at the synapse, which we know as synaptic.
plasticity. And that's what this slide just mentions. Activation of kinases leads to both retrograde messengers and trafficking of amperoreceptors into the postsynaptic cell. Now these mechanisms are responsible for the early stages of LTP, up to several hours. But we've seen that LTP can last for days. And what you saw in the video is that when memories actually start to last for a long period of time, days, hours, days, weeks, that's triggered by the growth of new synapses. And that's what we're trying to show here in this diagram. Initially, the memory was formed by changes at this particular synapse. But if that memory is going to actually last over days and weeks, there's actually the growth of a new synapse over here, or new synaptic spines. And therefore, we can say long-term memory or long-term mechanisms of LTP are dependent upon gene activation, which leads to protein synthesis and the formation of new synaptic connections. And this is a process that takes place in your brain as soon as you're born. And your brain is constantly laying down new synaptic connections, even into adult life, as you form new and new connections and you make new and new associations between things. So let me just repeat that. The early stages of LTP are due to presynaptic changes and postsynaptic changes. But the late stages of LTP and long-term memory requires the formation of actual new structures, new spines, new synapses. And you can actually see these neurons growing and connecting to each other in new ways in cell cultures. And this, therefore, depends on gene activation and protein synthesis. And again, there's much research seeking to understand these particular mechanisms. Now let us just conclude our consideration of LTP by comparing it with LTD. As a student, we require you to know the mechanism of LTP, but you don't need to know the exact mechanisms of LTD, except for some key points. And one of the key points that you need to know is that in both cases, the trigger for LTP and LTD is a calcium influx. But in order for LTP to occur, you need a large calcium influx. Whereas in order for LTD to occur, you need a much slower, prolonged calcium influx. So LTD is triggered by slow, low levels of calcium, whereas LTP is triggered by rapid increases in calcium concentration. And you can see that in this diagram here. In both cases, calcium is necessary. But in LTP, calcium activates protein kinases. And in LTD, calcium activates phosphatases that leads to LTD. So if we were to compare the two, we can say LTP is an increase in synaptic efficacy. LTP is an enduring weakening of synaptic strength. LTP involves the NMD receptor. And so does LTD, classic LTD and R, classic LTP. But it's the 2A, the NR2A receptor subunit that's important for LTP, and it's the NR2B subunit that's important for LTD in the hippocampus. We're talking here about very specific forms of these two um, processes that occur in the hippocampus. LTP requires kinase activation, LTV, LTD, sorry, requires intracellular phosphatases activation. And LTP results in insertion of AMPA receptors into the postsynaptic membrane, whereas LTD leads to their removal. And these are very clear statements that you can just study and consider as you're revising this particular topic. Okay, well, let's just conclude this lecture by looking at a couple of practical and clinical correlations. Um, why is it we are able to select certain pieces of information out of the thousands and millions of uh, bits of information that come to us on a daily basis? Um, if you think about it, you sit down in a room and there's light information and sound information and touch information streaming to you, and your brain can't store all of it. So what allows the brain to choose things that are important to store? And there seem to be two important things or two important principles that allows the brain to do this. The first is reliability. If you keep getting exposed to the same thing over and over and over again, the brain begins to say, oh, that must be important. Why is it being exposed over and over and over again? 
And this is something that you can use in your study techniques. If you go over something, you go over it today, you go over it tomorrow, you go over it next week. That constant repetition is necessary for forming the molecular structures of a memory. The second thing that seems to be very important in allowing a brain to hone in on something and uh, make it important is emotional arousal. It has been shown that emotional arousal facilitates retention. So amusing or arousing stories tend to be recalled better than neutral stories. And so when you're learning, it's important for you to try and attach importance and arousal to it. Whether it's because you're interested in the subject, whether you can see how this links to something that's personally important to you. If you have an emotional connection to it, or if it has importance to you, then you're more likely to remember it. It's also important to understand that pre- and post-learning events affect storage. You want to minimize anterograde and uh, retrograde um, uh, processes when you're learning. And one of the most important things that promotes memory consolidation is sleep. It seems that there's a replay of information within the hippocampus when we're sleeping. And it's almost as if you replay the day's events or you replay what you've learned. And so if you get a good night's sleep, it consolidates memory. It consolidates memory. The more you age, your sleep patterns change and you'll get less sleep. And it seems that replay decreases with age. And so it's very important for you as a student to understand that even though you want to do well in exams and you want to put in the necessary hours to work, that if you want to consolidate your memories, it's very important that you get enough sleep. And a loss of sleep leads to the production of products that can interfere with memory when you're actually awake. Other factors interfere with memory consolidation, such as alcohol, that reduces consolidation, whereas exercise seems to promote consolidation. And so it seems to me that just a healthy lifestyle actually leads to the promotion of memory storage and retrieval. Finally, let's just look at dementia. Now, the WHO of dementia is that dementia is a syndrome. It's usually chronic and progressive in nature. And there's a deterioration over time in cognitive function. Now, generally, as we all age, there's a bit of loss of cognitive function. And that's referred to as senile dementia, and it's considered normal. When we talk about dementia, we're talking about something that's uh, greater than what's normally associated with aging. And so dementia affects our cognitive functions like memory, thinking, our orientation in time and place, our ability to make judgments, to speak, our capacity to learn. All of these things comprise cognition. And dementia is a chronic progressive reduction in these capacities. That's beyond what's typically associated with aging. Please note, in all of these cases, consciousness is not affected. If consciousness is affected, then something else is going on. Now, dementia can be caused by many, many things. But the most common cause of dementia in today's world is Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease. But you can also have vascular dementias. These occur when you get small strokes in the brain, small occlusions of blood vessels. Small blood vessels get occluded. And so the brain substance slowly is de deteriorated. Is, is, is worsening over time, is deteriorating over time. And in multi-infarct dementia, what you find is there's a stepwise decrease in cognitive function. In Alzheimer's disease, it tends to be a very slow, progressive decrease. But in multi-infarct dementia, which could be due to hypertension or diabetes, you get this stepwise progression. It's almost as each time you get a series of uh, transient ischemic attacks or small uh, vascular occlusions, that leads to a further loss in cognition. You also have dementias that are associated with viral infections such as HIV, metabolic diseases, and also other disease processes like Parkinson's and Huntington's disease. However, the one that is most common, as I said before, is Alzheimer's disease. And because we are yet to have a cure for Alzheimer's disease, it's very, very important if somebody presents with dementia that you do a full screen to rule out all of these other causes which can be treated. So for example, you can reduce hypertension or diabetes. You can treat metabolic diseases. And Alzheimer's disease to some extent 
becomes a dis disease of exclusion. You can identify it Alzheimer's both because of the clinical symptomology but also because you've excluded all other causes of dementia. And this is a diagram on the right which just tells you of the terrible toll that a disease like Alzheimer's wreaks on the brain. This is the normal brain here on the left and this is the brain of an Alzheimer's patient. You can see uh, much of the brain substance has degenerated and is lost and as a result they no longer have full cognitive function. So Alzheimer's disease is associated with gra gradual progressive loss of memory. It's believed to affect about 50% of people over 85 and um, over uh, 60 it's believed to affect maybe up to 10% of people. Some people with certain genetic disorders do present with Alzheimer's disease much much earlier. And even though it affects memory it seems to have a widespread effect on the brain. This scan on the left shows glucose utilization in a normal brain and the red areas are showing the areas where a lot of glucose is being utilized. And the brain is a is a, is a hog for glucose. It consumes almost 25% of the body's energy. But in the Alzheimer's brain, it seems that it's in, unable to consume glucose and it's therefore unable to function. And the exact reasons for that are unclear. Um, but you can see the tremendous effect that it's having upon the brain, uh, this particular disease. Now, Alzheimer's disease is believed to be due to the accumulation of abnormal proteins. And two particular proteins have been implicated. The first is called amyloid beta, uh, and in particular amyloid beta 42, which is a shortened form of the amyloid beta protein. And that's spread throughout the cortex. And then the second is called the tau protein, which is associated with the microtubules that is found within the neurons. And the result of these protein degenerating is you get what are called plaques and tangles within the Alzheimer's brain. Plaques are believed to be due to deposits of this amyloid beta in the extracellular substances and tangles are believed to be due to degeneration of the tau proteins within the neurons. And different people advocate that it's more uh, amyloid beta as a trigger in Alzheimer's disease or tau as a trigger in Alzheimer's disease. What is clear is Alzheimer's disease is associated with neurofibrillary tangles and plaques. But unfortunately, we can only identify these things at death. To date, there's no cure for Alzheimer's disease. And only a few drugs have been developed that allow uh, some improvement. Most of these drugs are acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. Acetylcholine is involved in memory systems uh, based upon its role in the reticular formation. And you can see all of these drugs, Tacrin, Donazepil, Donapazil, and Rifastigmine, are uh, all are ACH inhibitors. A more modern drug is memantonine, or a newer drug. And this is an NMDA receptor antagonist, uh, and it seems to be uh, working uh, to reduce the amount of glutamate inside of the system which can be toxic to the brain. Okay. Um, the unfortunate thing about these drugs is these drugs only seem to slow down memory loss and they don't cure the disease and after a while they stop working. So that brings us to the end of today's lecture. Uh, in this lecture we've spent some time looking at learning and memory. We've explored our understanding of the classification of memory by looking at the famous case of patient HM and seeing that we now know that there are different types of memory. In particular, we see that there's both explicit memory and implicit memory. Then we wanted to understand, well, how are these memories stored? And we looked at famous studies by Eric Kandel on the sea snail, and we saw that he was able to prove for the first time that memories are actually stored within synapses, giving uh, evidence and scientific evidence, empirical evidence, to the concept of synaptic plasticity, the concept that synapses can change and they can be molded. And in doing that, it allows uh, memories to be stored. And then finally, we looked at um, the famous discovery of uh, Bliss and Lomo of LTP, and we've seen that LTP now seems to be the memory engram 
the molecular form of memory in animals, and we looked at its mechanism before concluding with some basic practical and um, clinical correlations with respect to learning and memory. I hope you've enjoyed this lecture. I hope you can take some of these things and apply it to how you yourself study and how you can use these understandings to improve your own learning and memory as you go forward in this course and in your career.